right, so truth be told, hand to God, um, I wasn't sure how to make this review. I don't want to do a same day review because first and foremost, it's an MMORPG, technically. So realistically speaking, there's no way in hell you're going to be able to figure out everything you need to know and truly get a sense of what it's going to be like on a day to day if you only did one day. And on top of that, right when I'm doing the finishing touches, wouldn't you believe it? There's an update that does user interface and aesthetic alterations and changes and adds new gameplay modes. Call myself wanting to put in, you know, 30 days and some change. Also wanting to get on screen related imagery and video stuff. Then I realized, oh, this thing is always going to be a pain in the ass. Let me just get it out the way whilst I can. So here we are. Now, with that being said, we're going to start off with the artistic design. The three Z's has a very, very unique mix and very, very unique situation. And I got to say, I'm in love with the artistic aesthetics. So they found a way to seamlessly blend something akin to urban style streetwear, jet set radio and tech wear aesthetics An aesthetic. I have a painful, painful love hate relationship with because, well, it doesn't do what it says nine times out of 10. And the stuff that does do what it says, aka actual technologically advanced wear, doesn't actually call itself that. But semantics at this point. Now, normally you would expect that to mean that every character fits into a certain style and feel. Well, no, depending on where you go, that completely changes. But your starting and default hub area is reminiscent of a tight knit city street corner store type feel and vibe and aesthetic. For those of you who grew up in a big city, but you're in a suburb that's within that big city, imagine something like that. Wall to wall stores going down a street, which there's no way in hell two cars could get through. And for some reason, there don't seem to be sidewalks. I'm not sure why that's a thing or why that's an issue, but there just isn't sidewalks. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but me. Anyways, generally speaking, the menu system and everything gels very very well together in fact i would say the menu system is almost like a toned down version of the infamous or i guess at this point famous persona 5 menu system now that's enough about the aesthetics which change by the character's affiliation most of the time let's get into the real real elements of this game starting with the gambling yeah we're going there all right so i'm gonna just say this right now virtual gambling is still gambling despite what the industry may think and say, or legally try to make distinct without actually proving that it's distinct. So I'm gonna tell you right now, if you are prone to any form of addiction relating to your money and finances, don't play games like these, period. Do not do it. Now with that out of the way, let me just say that, well, generating the currency needed to potentially get new characters or new stat modifying accessories, it's not hard. However, Patience is a virtue, by which I mean you can actually have genuine fun, having fun with what you're doing in this game, going to places where you don't have to go through the TV screen mini adventure and just beat things half to death and eventually earn stuff, as well as the occasional side quests that you get from your internet and your internet level going up that open up new side quests that get you things relating to stat increases, level increases, accessories for stat increases, accessories for level increases. <laughs> And of course, tangentially, materials and assets needed for creating or I guess spawning new characters. The primary currencies for this are monochrome film and polychrome film. Now for the film buffs out there, monochrome is when it's essentially black and white. Polychrome is when there is actual color for a film. Which is kind of weird because the way they introduce a new character is by essentially turning on a bunch of TVs not a bunch of old school projectors for film from like the fucking early or the mid 19th century. I don't know why they chose that. There seems like there was so many other better options, but you know, it's not too out of place in this type of aesthetic. You also have a little mini companion and you can gamble on things related to that mini companion, like getting a new one or occasionally just getting stat modifiers that can already enhance the ones that you may or may have. You can completely deny that system if you want to. In fact, I didn't even pull for a damn bang boo, that's what they're called, or black chow or bunny chow, cause that's all it is. It's all the chow from Sonic Adventure. 
until about two weeks into the game. And I'm probably never going to do it again because I don't care about the Bang Boo. They are fun and cute and whatnot, I guess, but I don't care enough about them to try to catch them all. My Pokemon addiction died in 2003, maybe four, who knows. But that's essentially what it relates to. Getting a stat modifying piece of equipment that you can put in your character and also level up and stack into itself up to five star ranks and also potentially getting a new character. Those are the only two, thank God. Now, with that being said, not every character is in a general pool. Like with any game of this nature, there's banner pulling. For the uninitiated, banner pulling is the nickname given to when a character or a special type of iteration of a character is temporarily available for a limited amount of time. It's essentially done to increase player engagement, which we all know is bullshit. It's done to try to make you feel, feel the fear of missing out. Because theoretically, more the more people feel FOMO, the bigger the chance of them spending money to try to make sure they get the character they like. Now in the primary pool, the one that is essentially never going to leave, we don't know if they will or will not add new characters. Currently, at this point in time, and this point in year that you're seeing this video, there has not been an increase to the base pool. However, the base pool has an added caveat that might make people want to use the base pool possibly more than those temporary premium polychrome pools. In the base gacha system, you can get a guaranteed character pool of your choice after 300 pulls. How long does it take to do 300 pulls? Well, that depends on how long you're going to wait to spend money. For example, I, as someone who's been playing for a month, and I believe I've logged in close to maybe 100, maybe 200 hours, I'm about 70 pulls away from this 300 pull. Factor that in. However, were I to spend money, I would be spending somewhere around damn near two or three hundred dollars. Oh, uh, fuck that. Also, for the uninitiated, the game doesn't seem to tell you this, but it's very unique or very weird, or maybe I miss it and it does tell you. You can actually take the polychrome from black and white or color and convert them into one or the other. Doing that allows you to potentially farm for a lesser asset and material and convert it and upgrade it into what you need to do a pull for a different entire, you know, temporary premium pull. I think that's pretty cool. However, that needs to be like more commonly stated. Now, going into the story elements, uh, we got a bit of a very fun and unique situation. So, story elements that will relate to characters you don't have, you're not barred from getting access to. Which is, I think, one of the major selling points that's really not shared enough among people who talk about the game. I barely even say it in any type of discourse or even on a Discord. Yes, I'm on the Zenless Zone Zero Discord. So, essentially, for example, let's say you have a character by the name of Lycan or Lycon. He's a werewolf butler who knows Chun-Li style ice kung fu. Yes, you heard me right. You may even see some of his footage throughout this uh, video. Okay, that guy has an entire story that is themed after a movie you watch in the shelf in your main primary hub room in the central location. You can access that without having him unlocked. You can also do it for almost every other character who's in the base roster, and they're going to add more characters over time, which I think is legitimately cool because you get to know the character, you get to understand the character, and you get to see the depth that they put in them. Mind you, you know, mileage may vary with that because depth in a game like this when it comes to character development is not something that uh, I would essentially say is a guarantee. However, you could also learn things that there's no way for your character to learn or have come across. Most of these events take place as a side story per se, but they could easily be spliced into the real time. Now, when it comes to the regular story, that one's a little bit, I guess, odd, depending on how you look at it. So there is no overworld action map. You are put into a almost mini game like system where you and your bang boo of choice take it into the hollow world. The hollow world is essentially the places where the enemy spawn. Let's call it what it is. But you're going through a bunch of different small little TVs. And you're trying to do small little mini quests to can further get down into this until you initiate or get to an area that will initiate a cutscene or combat. Or there will be combat scenarios that happen and take you out of that little TV station and you go into actual fighting in a closed off Devil May Cry style area. Now for the uninitiated, that basically means there is a set limit to how far you can go 
in this area that you are fighting and you can't get out of it. Invisible barriers, sometimes visible barriers. Your only way out is to fight. There is no escape. However, that leads me into, you know, one of my next things, the gameplay. So the story elements are kind of sort of almost hidden by gameplay and the gameplay elements almost kind of sort of overtaken by story depending on who you ask. But essentially the way the game works is as follows. You get a quest, whether it's story or side quest, you go into your little bang boo control system and you go into the TV exploration system as I mentioned. So technically it's not instance, but it is at the same time because the minute you go into these fights, there is no automation at that point. You go into these fights, you load in the three characters that you selected before you started this story, exp this story expansion, and then you fight with them and maybe your bang boo if you choose to bring one as well. Then you go right back out into that exploratory TV screen like maze system filled with small puzzles. Personally, I don't hate that. And they don't go on too long. Or if they have optional stuff, you can skip it, get to the end or get to combat. So I honestly don't have a problem with it. However, on top of that, there are so many other alternate modes. I don't even understand why I didn't get attached to something else. I mean, still keep it in the game, but you don't need to attach it to the story shit, do you? Okay, so as far as other gameplay modes, which at the time of this recording, a brand new one came out either yesterday or it's coming out next week. So it's always something. Your character can occasionally go into story paths that have them controlling something besides your initial default character, Faithen, or Wise and his sister. Uh, I believe her name is Sora. I don't remember because I'm so used to calling them both collectively Faithen. That's cool. The most recent one at the time of this was the Jane Doe arc, where you essentially played an undercover detective whose name, real name probably isn't Jane Doe, as she was trying to expose or destroy and destabilize a particular gang group. That's extremely fucking cool. However, this essentially amounted to her basically chatting with people and going through a stage, finding key cards that ended in a boss fight. It was roughly maybe, I want to say a full hour of side quests, but it was interesting. However, the execution was the problem in that case. Now, the other modes are in this VR tower or essentially an arcade like area that simulates VR by not actually being VR. It's just a place for you to go and take your characters to gather raw materials without going in the story mode. It's essentially a training simulator, but you actually get something for it. You can farm essentially any base currency and some advanced currencies that can do everything from making your character level up to powering up some of their items. It is very, very fun because you're basically in a beat em up at that point. The only downside I can honestly say I have with a lot of these external gameplay things is that none of it is co-op, which is another thing that we're going to get into before we go to combat. So there's a friend link system and they've shown off in various formats and modes that there will be times where there is co-op, whether it's what most will consider in game. I don't. It's an MMO and it's the first year it's been out uh, modes that are meant for hyper elite players or it's side questing modes or survival modes. It doesn't matter. A lot of this content could use some co-op. I've even texted some of my friends in game and said, hey, where is it we can go to do co-op? People play way longer than me. I don't know, but apparently it's going to be here at some point. Bro, that is the definition of a lost opportunity and a cock tease, but more so lost opportunity. We know it's going to happen, but they haven't told us when. So believe me when I say if you don't want to mess with the story in this game, you don't have to. You honestly don't, but you benefit from at least increasing your inner knot level because that gives you access to more side stories, which gives you access to more chances to get stat increasing items. And you can go from there. Your characters do not level traditionally like they would in a regular RPG. You have to manually purchase their levels and you can't de-level to make it to give yourself a challenge. Now going into combat. Oh, dear sweet mother of God. Oh, if this combat was a woman, we would have five kids and she would be mad at me because she walked with a limp every day. <sighs> the combat. So if you have any familiarity with the arcade style formats, which are known as the beat em up and hack and slash, and you know what's become essentially more closer to the God of War 3 Devil May Cry franchise minus aerial combat elements and aesthetics 
and eh, to a lesser degree or a similar degree Bayonetta, you're going to feel right at home because the way your character's controls have been simplified, they don't have extremely long combo strings, but they do have the wait and pause system or the hold system, which is similar to Devil May Cry. The only thing they're missing is the tap system. So here's the way basic combat works. You have your normal attack and your special attack and your super attack. Your normal attack, depending on who you use, can hit different distances or you could hold it to create a different function based on what the character allows you to do with the secondary meter being filled or just because you paused your technique at the right amount of time. The move list and the tutorial for the characters will let you know everything. You can even do tutorials with characters before you get them. You know, the wet your whistle game. Now the EX special button, which initially I assumed was just the heart attack button, is usually a move that is relegated for if you filled up whatever your secondary meter is called in this game or tertiary meter. But yes, there's more than two meters, depending on the character. However, everybody has to build up the base meter. For those who aren't sure which one it is, seriously, just look under your HP bar, the green one. That's your EX meter. Now here's what blows my mind though. For some reason, your special attack button does not have a corresponding metric gauge displayable. Meaning, you only know when that thing is full when the actual on-screen icon is displayed. I feel like that could have just been meterized. Is meterized a word? Moving on. So, you get characters who essentially specialize in close range, some are more mid-range, and of course we got people who utilize guns. They are very few and far between, let me tell you. And, if memory serves, at this point in time of this video, uh, both your gun characters are default characters. So, yeah, they, they're, they're not really trying. They want there to be beat em up. They want characters to have elements. They want characters to have interesting, unique weapons and fighting styles. But then they said, fuck it with the gun people. You have one person who will hit you like a club with a minigun or a gatling gun, depending on who you ask. And then you have standard, I am a essential Deadpool knockoff in the best way possible. I mean that because they did a good job. Billy the Kid, who dual wields long slide magnums or some form of long slide 45 or 50 caliber. I don't know what them things is, but if you get shot by them, your ass ain't getting up. I don't care if you got a vest on. And that's it. That is essentially it. Everyone else is some deviation of the Far East weaponry stereotypes, or they are going to come up close and hit you, barring very few exceptions. But again, this is the first year of the game, and we all know how this stuff works. Whenever they make a new faction or show off new characters, there's always going to be three or four or four or five that follow them. But at the time that I'm giving this review, I can only tell you the honest truth and what I know. In case it wasn't obvious, I'm not sponsored. So, let me be clear. The combat is insanely fun. There is parry mechanic or parry features. There is blocking features, depending on the character, which I have a problem with. And there's assist type functionality. That's why you can bring three characters with you because you don't just wait for one to die. You can switch them out or you can use them as a block button, which is where I have a problem. And it's one of the only legitimate problems I have with the gameplay. Why is it blocking is relegated to a character type? Furthermore, some of those block character types don't actually use a shield at the point in, at this point in time. That's literally one character, but that's too few. They don't have to be the strongest block. They don't have to be the best block, or maybe they can have a block that specializes in blocking one type of attack versus another, you know, but I feel like everyone should have a block. Now, other than that, I believe the final crime that is committed with their combat of so few and far between, like I said, Technically, you don't have to have a jump button. Technically, you don't have to have aerial maneuvers and aerial combat. No one said you had to. That's not what gets me. Why the fuck can I not turn off all these display icons on screen when I'm fighting? I don't need these. I don't need these. I don't have the option to even shrink their size. This is wholeheartedly unnecessary and aggravating. And for the record, I haven't just played this game on a PC. In fact, the footage you're seeing should be only from the PS5 version. I should be able to move these icons or turn them off. I do not like it. I know this is a game that's meant to be on cell phones. I get it. That's not my problem. My problem is I'm not on the cell phone playing. Man, is it annoying. All right, so when it comes to enemy design, uh, we're in luck, so to speak. Yes, it doesn't seem like they have a lot of varieties right now, but again, this thing is pretty much in a beat-em-up MMO. 
we know there's going to be more enemy varieties. Look no further than Dungeon Fighter Online, which if there ever was a company that could do some crossovers with the with these guys, it would be Dungeon Fighter stuff. I'd love to see that. So, believe me when I tell you I like what they're doing. They have three categories of enemy. They have human beings or human-like characters, or we'll just call them homo sapien-like characters. We have machinery, the mechanicals, and then we have supernatural fucked up zombie person who doesn't have a face and just has a swirling ball of energy where his head should be. I wish there was a more better way to say that. <laughs> and that more better was proper grammar, but there isn't. Yes, I know what they're called. I'm going to display it on screen. I'm making a joke. I have to say that because sometimes these videos end up on Spotify and people don't know that there's a video attached to these. Hey, Spotify audience, y'all do know that legitimately almost everything you hear from me there's a video version of right anyways the noise enemies uh or the enemies that produce the weird noises are essentially some form of unique entity that they came up with for this game and i like it in fact i don't think there's enough of them however they've been adding varieties almost every single story chapter so i can't really complain some of them stay in one place or try to get far away and hit you from a distance with energy attacks some of them want to get up close and try to beat that ass. And some of them are just meant to be essentially able to power through with super armor, practically anything. Some of them even have electrical elements, fire elements, etc., etc. And some of them are just extremely, extremely difficult because they're a unique type of enemy, like the motorcycle one that transforms. It was more than meets the eye. So honestly, I can't complain about the enemy design and I look forward to seeing more. Because at the time of this recording, there's like maybe 30. So that basically means two for every currently playable or currently accessible, let me say that, character. To be fair, on paper, there's not nothing wrong with that. But there's also an extreme lack of bosses. And I mean, there's an extreme lack. If I'm counting correctly, I believe there's only at this time eight, yes, eight bosses or boss class enemies total. Eh. The mini bosses are cool, though. But that's really one of the only negative things I could say about it. Now, when it comes to the music, they've done something a little bit unique. It feels very 90s adjacent, but it also feels like there's a level of techno to it. But they understood the difference between cinematic music and game music. Now, for those who don't remember, uh, Nobuo Uematsu has been mentioning throughout random interviews for at least, I believe, five or six years. He's scared of seeing game music essentially go extinct or be converted into cinematic music. Now, there is not an official definition for what constitutes game music versus music or cinema cinematic music. But let me tell you up front. Here's the issue that I, at least that I can figure out. Game music is music that is meant to work in a specific setting at a specific time at a specific point during someone's gameplay. Not just it matches the world around it. That's ambient music. Or B-roll music, if you will. I think that's what he might have meant. And if that's my understanding of his definition and interpretation, well, it didn't die with Zenless Zone Zero. They understood the assignment. When I load into a screen that's my own little video store because your character is a business owner, it feels like I'm playing and listening to game music. When I go in to do one of those little side quests that boost up my stats temporarily for the next couple of fights, I feel like I've converted and switched over into game music. I never don't feel like I'm leaving game music. I just feel like I'm switching or converting to a different style or aesthetic of game music, no matter what I'm doing in this game. I fucking love it. So, uh, just to summarize, the aesthetics of this game and this game style are second to none. Almost nothing like that is available on the international market and it's a breath of fresh air. However, I'm also not going to sit up here and lie to you and tell you that the character designs are perfect or they're extremely, extremely unique and cool. Some of them are, some of them are generic as fuck, but when you get to the faces, we all know, you don't even need me to say it. They completely dropped the ball and they gave them the most generic cliche Japanese animu faces. Their noses are essentially the Dreamcast trigger, or they're just the bottom end of a lowercase j, but sharpened up. It is so weird how 
you can have these characters that have extremely high levels of detail in their clothing and design. And then when you get to their face, eh, fuck it. We'll just do some animu shit. Listen, I have nothing against the stereotypical Japanese cartoon aesthetic. My issue is when it gets overused and it becomes cliche, static, stale, and boring. The characters' clothing, outfits, and their color schemes, they are cool. They look nice. They're easy to understand, most of them, and they're naturally interesting, and it makes them stand out, which is something you want to do, especially when you don't have a flash flagship character or a mascot character in a game like this. If you don't have one character that stands out and looks the best and it pulls the most attention, try to make everybody do something. I get that. But then you get to the face and it's like, it's like no one even tried. Hmm, well this one has blue eyes. What should we do with the next character? Oh, I know, we'll give them Azure eyes. For those who don't know, Azure is a shade of blue. So that's what it feels like. They did everything that they could do, that they should, minus the gambling aesthetic. I wouldn't have got no problem paying a dollar a month or five bucks a month to access this game. Shit's fun. And then when we get to the faces, it's just a ball drop. Now, with the cutscenes and story, man, that's pretty good, too. Some things are animated and some things are told in a North American style comic book format or a colorized format, if you will, of graphic novel. And I actually dig that aesthetic. Not everything can be animated. This game would be way too big for that. But they know when to do the right things. So I honestly can't find anything too bad with it other than I don't like how much clutter I've accumulated in a small amount of time. I've been playing this game that has to do with stat modification and item modification and character leveling. I feel like there should be less clutter. However, like I said, they've done user interface designs and alterations to somewhat co accommodate people who are having that issue. Personally, just let the shit stack. That's how I view it. Let it stack. Just have a number by it. I don't need to see 400 of one item. Just give me that one item picture and then times 400. That's how I feel. So in closing, I'm going to give Zenla Zone Zero a a minus this game is very fun it's addictive to play not because of the gambling elements and you can tell it's going to be supported well into the future and i don't foresee there being any major changes that could possibly make people lose interest like everyone did going from fantasy star online 2 to fantasy star online 2 ngs thank you for ruining that microsoft thank you so much by the way so yeah, uh, I hope you have fun. Please consider getting therapy or talking to someone in your family who you care about or a friend and loved one if you feel like you may have a gambling addiction. This game is interesting. This game is fun. And the story has this ability to go from wholesome cliche to actually interesting. And the best part is you don't have to worry about accessing it if you don't have the character. You can get it or you can get some side story elements relating to it. Which, hell, that would have dropped it into a B minus, maybe a C even. So yeah, I hope you have fun in Zenless Zone Zero. And make some goddamn co-op.